I feel like we just need to take a moment just to soak that in. Just to, just to feel and to hear and to know what God, what God is doing through us and in us. God, right now, got a battery problem here. Michael. Just God reminding us of what He's doing in our midst, in our presence. What a powerful thing. Knowing that it's not us that are doing these amazing things, but that God's working through us, and we're starting to see some very beautiful things, very powerful things. I want to welcome you to this morning's worship. I'm Pastor Jason, and I have the honor, the privilege of serving all of you as your pastor this morning. And I want to welcome each of you, knowing that we together are the body of Christ. And sometimes we come in here looking like the bruised and battered body of Christ, but this is it. And Jesus chose each of us to be hands and his feet in our world today. And that's a humbling and, and very powerful thing. I want to remind you that as we dig into our worship service this morning, you got this program and uh, there's some really cool stuff in here. There's this thing that we call the dashboard. And if you ever never taken a look at this, there's all kinds of just short stories in here on, on the back telling you what's, what's happening in this ministry we don't always see. But I also want to remind you on the back side today, there's this worship outline. This is your, your uh, key, your compass to the worship service this morning. You'll see little suns right there that will signify that there's a point to uh, respond to in your program. You can take this with you throughout the and let it continue to be a, uh, a strengthening and a focusing and a grounding presence throughout your week. We're in our third sermon of our sermon series in Truth About Love. And uh, we're talking about what God's love is and how it feels. And sometimes we, we build love up to be something that it's not. And so when God's loving on us, we miss it. Or we think that it's something else. Maybe it's, it's distance from God or God despising us or, or punishing us. And so, uh, so we're digging into this. And uh, we're talking about the truth and that love doesn't lie. And I was thinking, you know, one of the things that, uh, I'm, I'm young enough, new enough in my marriage, Sarah and I have been married for two and a half years, and uh, in spite of anyone's um, best recommendations, I've really been struggling with something. See, I, I, it is this, this constant nagging in my heart that as a pastor especially, I have to be honest with Sarah all the time, Right? <laughs> all the time. And, and I do this because I want Sarah to know that um, when she's um, asking me in really important matters that, uh, that she knows that, um, you know, he, he's telling the truth. He's not just making a fib or, or saying what's easy. But, um, but there's one particular area where this is a real challenge for us. And it happens every other morning uh, in our frenzied uh, routine for getting ready for, uh, for clinical for Sarah or for church for me. Um, and uh, it's that question. And it sounds a lot like, does this look all right? <laughs> what do we do? <laughs> oh no. It's almost, you know, I should like get up an hour early so I can avoid that whole situation. Because I want to tell the truth. I want to be honest to Sarah. I mean, I owe that to her, and, and, and that's important to us. Um, but in my desire to be completely transparent and honest, and, and, you know, people have said again and again and again, don't go there. Like, this is one of those weird uh, exceptions to the rule where you can just say, dear, you look wonderful. <laughs> but, but, yeah, no, but... In, in my, I don't know, my, uh, my legalism, whatever it is, I'm like, no, you've got to tell the truth. Always be honest. So that way when she confronts you on something else and you say no, she's going to believe you. <laughs> and so I'm sitting there, I'm like, well, you know, like, um, it, the colors wouldn't be something I would wear together. <laughs> or sometimes I even go to that where I know this is like thin, thin ice. I'll say, you know, like, I don't know, it just doesn't fall right on you, maybe. I know, so poor Sarah, because, um, you know, that's just how clothes work, but like how that makes a person feel, that's a, that's a, that's a dagger right in the heart. So you, you see what happens when we talk about truth. Now, love refuses to hide from the truth. 
Love refuses not to tell the truth. God's love does. If it's not seeking the truth, then it's not love that is from God. But how do we live into that in our lives? Because the truth is, in the matter of this situation, Sarah's asking me, does this look okay? What we both know makes the whole morning so much smoother, so much more peaceful, and at least for the short term, our marriage so much happier, is if I say, that looks, that looks awesome. <laughs> Beautiful. Because it makes it easier for me to live in, to, to, I mean, honestly, to tell that lie. So, it, and it also, um, it makes it easier on Sarah because she can go and, and she's free. She's beautiful. Now, the truth is she is beautiful, but in the midst of this, we're both kind of hoping that the lie is going to be the best thing for us. But the truth is, is that God's love, God's pure love always seeks the truth. That God's love and our loving others, they are ultimately the same thing. What Sarah is ultimately seeking is not for me to tell her a fib about how she looks, but to be able to find that truth in my heart, to be able to respond, and regardless of how an cloth- article of clothing looks, to be able to tell her how beautiful she is in my eyes and in my heart and in that covenant that we've made. But it's not easy. Telling the truth is not easy. So this is the first thing in our worship outline this morning, is because when we're looking at the truth, we often uh, find the, taste, the truth to be distasteful in our lives because of how it disrupts the harmony in our lives and our situations. You know, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, telling the truth or seeking the truth or hearing the truth complicates our interactions. Because no longer is it okay just to, how are you, I'm fine, and just kind of breeze over things and not, never dig into the stuff. When we tell the truth, seek the truth, listen to the truth, hear the truth, it disrupts. We can't just be happy and, and tell each other we're fine. We're going deeper. And, and we're talking about how we really are. What's really happening or heavy on our hearts. The other thing is that uh, oftentimes the truth hurts our self-image. Because when we hear the truth or are told the truth from someone else, we have to wrestle with that person in the mirror and the actions that we've lived into in our life in the past week. We don't want to hear the truth because then we walk away feeling like a schmuck. The truth often also causes us pain from redirection. There's so many times when I'm praying through this you know, monstrous list of people that are on the prayer list. I'm praying and I'm saying, Lord, I just pray that you'll be with them and give them your truth. And oftentimes that truth says where you're going, what you're doing, where your heart is, is not okay. And that's a really tough thing to hear because it causes a lot of pain when we have to step away from something that we truly have invested in or love or believe is what is right for our lives. And yet, sometimes the truth does that to us. The truth also is something that we don't necessarily like because it causes us discomfort from the vulnerability. Man, telling someone the truth, making sure that your wife doesn't leave in some strange outfit that's going to repel and send people running. Uh, Sarah's never wore one of those, but you know, if it happened, that's, that's our goal here, right? <laughs> I know, poor Sarah. (laughs) Vulnerability is painful, and when we feel, when we know that we have to tell the truth in a moment, that is scary, and we would rather do anything other than be confronted with having to tell that truth or to hear that truth. When that is spoken to God, spoken through God to us about a truth about our lives or our choices, our situations, or when someone else tells us a truth that hurts. We would rather get angry or point our fingers back at someone else than deal with that truth. Yet, as much as we may not always like the truth, it is powerful, it is holy, and it is sacred. Jesus talks about the truth and the life all the time. And in this powerful instance, Jesus portrays the value and the power of truth in a way that maybe we've never seen before uh, through this this particular event. And I want to invite you to turn with me to Luke's gospel this morning. We'll be beginning in chapter 8. 
I want to remind you as you're um, searching for Luke this morning that if you don't have a Bible or yours is old and in shambles um, or it's just time for a new one, there are always Bibles available on that small table just outside of the worship center here in the atrium. You can grab one, write your name in it. We don't want you to borrow it. We want you to own it. Take it home. You can also use your smartphone, your, uh, your wireless device, whatever it is, however it is that you get into God's Word, but we want you to own it. And we want you not just to hear it, but to let it uh, be before your eyes that you're holding it and you know that it is God's word for you as well. So we hear about a woman in Luke's gospel in this particular situation who is chasing after Jesus. Now Jesus is, uh, he's teaching and he's walking through the synagogues, the temple, and, and some of these open spaces and there are just crowds surrounding him because he's become a figure. Um, sometimes for some people a figure of contention and for others a figure of, of amazement and miracles. And, uh, and there's no breathing room for Jesus. So we're going to start in the second part of verse 42 um, in that first sentence. And uh, common English Bible is what we always preach from here, teach from. And we're told that as Jesus moved forward in that crowd, he faced smothering crowds. There's no shoulder room. There's no elbow room here. Uh, it's tight because people are, there's this frenzy of, uh, of energy around who Jesus is in his presence among them. Verse 43, though, we hear about a woman who was there who had been bleeding for 12 years of her life. She had spent her entire livelihood on doctors, but no one could heal her. So Jesus is walking through this crowd, and we're suddenly hearing about this woman who for 12 years has been subject to bleeding. No doctor has been able to heal her. She has been rejected by the community. She has spent every penny that she has on all these remedies and nothing has ceased her pain and her suffering. So verse 44, she's there and she came up behind Jesus and she touched the hem of his clothes. Just the hem. She touched the hem and at once her bleeding stopped. Somehow this woman makes it through the crowd and she is chasing after Jesus. And whether she's saying, you know, no doctor has been able to heal me, but maybe... Or maybe she says, I know it is Jesus. I've been, I've, I've been corrected. I've been chasing after Jesus. But today's the day I'm finally face to face with him. She touches the hem of his cloak and she is healed. It's a powerful thing. Well, look what happens. Verse 45. Who touched me? Jesus asked. He turns around and he says, who touched me? And of course, everyone around him is denying it. Oh, it wasn't me. I didn't, I, you know, I, I, I bumped shoulders with you, but I didn't touch you, you know, like not the way I think you're talking about. When everyone denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowds are surrounding you and pressing in on you. In other words, Peter, and I love how just honest Peter is. He comes up and he says, uh, Jesus, what are you, who touched you? About a hundred people just touched you. What kind of question is this? But Jesus is not letting this go. Verse 46, he says, uh, But Jesus said, Someone touched me. I know that power has gone out of me. Finally, when the woman saw that she couldn't escape notice, she came trembling before Jesus and fell before him. In front of everyone, she explained why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. After this, after she exposed herself and revealed it was her who had done this, Jesus said to her, verse 48, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. What a powerful story. See, on the surface, what we're seeing is this woman who um, is having to tell the truth, that she has kind of snuck into the crowd, touched Jesus' cloak, and gotten healed. And and Jesus wants to hold her accountable to this. And and, uh, some of us might say, well, you know, she stole Jesus' healing, and Jesus wants to make sure that... uh, that she knows, that he knows, and all this stuff. But there's, there's a lot of deeper stuff going on with how Jesus is working with the truth. The first thing that we know is that this woman was poor and rejected. She had spent all of her money, all of her inheritance on, on trying to get well, so she, uh, she, she had absolutely nothing. We also know that according to the Jewish tradition and Jewish customs, uh, that if you were bleeding, whether 
whether you're a woman and you are uh, facing uh, your monthly, your, your periodic menstruation or whether you're bleeding for other, any other reason, if you are a man and you are bleeding, you were labeled unclean. Anyone who was labeled unclean was to remove themselves from the community and uh, actually hang out in this area that was for unclean people only and you weren't allowed to go back and be a part of the community until you either waited a certain amount of days or you could prove that the bleeding had stopped and you would go before the priests and you would let them uh, look you over and then they would say okay you're no longer unclean you're okay you can go home you could you could if you were unclean you couldn't be in your home at that time you were absolutely removed from the community this woman is unclean for 12 years she has been removed and outcasted from the community from her home because of her condition it is also true that when a, uh, anyone who was interacting with an unclean person, that especially if it were a male, he should not acknowledge her, touch her, look her in the eyes, or speak to her out of the risk that he too might also become labeled unclean and have to be removed from the community for a certain period of time. The third thing that we also need to see in the midst of this is that um, oftentimes we read scripture and we're saying, you know, yeah, Jesus was really being hard on the woman, you know. It, it was okay that she touched him because that's what Jesus does. He heals people and, and that's just, you know, something that he needed to accept. Uh, and we're a little bit confused. It's like, shouldn't Jesus know who touched him? Well, the thing is, Jesus does know. And we can see what happens next in the ways that he is bringing about the truth in this deep and powerful way, not just for the woman, but for everyone gathered there and seeing what's happening. The first thing that we see is that um, Jesus proves and shows this beautiful and important truth that we are not made unclean because of the situations or the circumstances of our bodies. We're not unclean because we touch something, because we eat something, that we are made unclean because of the rubble in our hearts and what we allow into our hearts. Jesus is proving and pointing out this powerful truth that is a disruption of all the law and all of the legalities and all of the tradition leading up to it. And he is saying, you need to quit looking on the surface of who is unclean and you need to look deeper and understand what it really means to be unclean. The next truth that Jesus is enacting is he's reminding everyone that the love of God and the love of Jesus that is flowing out from him does not stop at any boundary or barrier. It does not care if Jesus shouldn't be talking to this woman, if he's breaking all the rules in the whole world by talking to this woman and, and letting her touch him. He acknowledges who touched me immediately because she touched him. Jesus is labeled unclean in the, in the way that the law follows. And he is acknowledging that and he's saying, I love this person and I don't care what you think. And I don't care what's right in your book. Another powerful truth. Another thing that he's acknowledging is her need and exposing that need that each of us have. Jesus is proving this valuable and important lesson to everyone gathered there. That there is a need that none of us can satisfy outside of who Jesus is. And it doesn't matter if you're clean or unclean. Jesus says it doesn't matter who you are. I will talk to you. No boundary will keep us separate. And finally, Jesus teaches the truth about faith. You see, this woman, um, just like uh, many of us still live into superstitions, um, you know, I don't know, you, you can think of the Huskers, you know, coming out of the tunnel and everyone touches the horseshoe, it's for good luck. See, this woman was like, oh, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to touch the horseshoe. She's gonna, she says, I will be healed. I will be healed. <laughs> There's, there's a safety zone here. I will be healed if I touch the hem of that cloak. And Jesus says, okay, woman, you, you're on the right track here, and I want everyone to see this, and I want you to see this too, but you're on the right track. But the main thing you need to understand here is it is not that you were healed because you rubbed my cloak or you did something else, or you, you, know, you, you stood on one foot. It's because your faith healed you. 
And he wants everyone around to see that truth. You, this woman's faith healed her. Nothing else healed her but that. You see what Jesus is doing with truth? It's not simply a matter of telling the truth or living into the truth. We see how powerful it is. And in this simple act, Jesus is exposing truth on so many levels and layers, getting people to see the power of who Jesus is truly in our lives. But again, we don't like the truth, do we? The truth is something that we avoid so as to avoid that tension. The truth is something that we escape so we escape the pain of having to deal with how, how things really are. The truth is something that we avoid because when we are addressed with the truth, oftentimes we pick up shame and put it on our shoulders believing that that's where it belongs. We avoid truth because we are afraid to seem critical to others or mean. We don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. We avoid the truth because we don't want to change. We like the trajectory we're going. We like how this feels. We like where the ultimate goal looks. We like how it looks. But truth does something really powerful in our lives. I also want to invite you to turn to John's Gospel this morning. Also to chapter 8. To John's Gospel, chapter 8. John was the last of the four Gospels to be written. It's the fourth in our lineup of the four Gospels in the first part of the New Jesus is, again, all of these teachings are from Jesus confronting or having discussions or uh, intense moments with, uh, with the Pharisees or the Jews surrounding him. And Jesus is, uh, he says in verse 31, um, he says in, in the midst of who he is, verse 31, he says, Jesus said to the Jews who believed in him, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings. So right there he's saying, if you follow my teachings, if you allow yourself to hear these truths, you will remain my disciples. Verse 32, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So Jesus is saying, look, you've got to find the truth, and you've got to let it into your life, and you've got to let it break your heart sometimes, and I guarantee you it's going to break all of our hearts at some point in our lives or many times in our lives as it keeps us on the right path, as it keeps us in the right trajectory to freedom. And Jesus says, if you continue to do this, and if you let it break your hearts and let it remold you and shape you, it will set you free. You're not going to like it. But it will give you a freedom that you could never have imagined, that you could have never gained any other way in your lives. Freedom that feels like this explosion of life and of new life. This is life with Christ. Galatians chapter 5, 1, again, the fruits of the Spirit are uh, caught by Paul in, uh, in his letter to the church in Galatia. And he says, as he begins chapter 5, he says, Christ has set us free for the sake of freedom, that we have been given this freedom that we can truly live free lives. And the truth sets us free to give us freedom. We're also reminded in John's Gospel, just a little bit after in chapter 8, where Jesus says uh, that the truth will set you free. He says that if the Son makes you free, then you are truly free indeed. You see, although we don't, also, we don't always associate truth with love, we can see that when truth sets us free and gives us this new life and this freedom that we've never experienced or couldn't imagine any other way, then we see that this gift is a gift of freedom, is a gift of love. So if you're following along in your worship outline, I skipped over one here, but the truth, though it might hurt, it produces freedom. Freedom from, for our lives. And we ultimately see that this freedom is God's ultimate gift of life, setting us free from our past, setting us free from our sins, our transgressions, the ways that we have destroyed our lives and others' lives. This is that powerful gift of love. And so today I invite us to live in love, to live in truth. 
Proverbs is a powerful reminder for how that looks in our lives. And I know I've got you flying all over your Bible today, but let's have some fun with this. And Proverbs 12, now it's right after the Psalms in your Bible. If you open up the middle of your Bible, it's going to be just after the Psalms. We're looking at chapter 12 in Proverbs today. Proverbs is this whole list, we believe, that is primarily written by King Solomon who followed King David. King, David, King Solomon was David's son and he wrote all these wisdom sayings and they said that Solomon was the wisest man on earth according to how God chose to bless him and create him and cause him to be a leader in his time. And so we have this saying about truth in beginning in verse 17 of the 12th chapter of Proverbs. Those who state the truth speak justly, but a false witness deceives. In other words, those who are speaking truth live in a just world, but those who speak falsely live in a world of deception. Some chatter on like a stabbing sword, but a wise tongue heals. Many times we believe in our society, in our world, that the more we say, the better we can make things. But we are reminded by Proverbs that sometimes the more you say, the worse it gets, so shut up. And let God use the right words that will cause healing. Verse 19, truthful lips endure forever, but a lying tongue lasts only for a moment. We want what we say to last, to mean something. When we say, you look beautiful, we want that to last beyond the quick flash and image in the mirror. We want it to last the whole day. And so when we learn to tell the truth, it lasts and endures. Verse 20, deceit is in the heart of those who plan evil, but there is joy for those who advise peace. Knowing that when we trust in the truth, it will set us free and it will give us peace in our lives. Truth brings justice. Truth cultivates wisdom and healing. Truth is sustaining and long-lasting. Truth brings joy and peace. This morning I want you to consider the areas in your life where you may need to hear truth spoken to you. This morning I want you to consider what areas in your life may you need, you, you've been hearing the truth for a long time, what areas in your life may you need to accept that truth and embrace it even if it hurts. Today I want each of us to consider, and I don't preach anything I don't need to hear or do myself, myself um, there's more than me, I guess, is for each of us to consider where we need to confess the truth, whether it be to someone else, or to God. Today I want each of us to consider where it is that we might need to tell another person the truth, even if it hurts, trusting in God. Now Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, 15, that we are to always speak the truth in love, and if we do, that we will continue to grow in Christ. Now, a lot of people like to use the truth to hurt people. And they say, you know, I'm just, I'm saying, I'm just saying this because I love you. And then they go ahead and blow our worlds apart. And I want each of us also to consider that when we speak the truth, is it in love? Does it bring forth peace and justice? Does it bring forth freedom that God and Jesus are fully a part of? Because otherwise, if we're telling and we're telling it just to hurt someone or to blow someone's world apart, it's just as much of a lie as any other sort of deception. Let us consider these things. Let us consider how this truth sets us free. And even though it is painful in the meantime, in the short time, how free it sets us because Jesus sets us free through his mercy, through his grace, through his salvation, through his new life. Let us pray.